the Japanese Association of Assassins, formerly known as the JAA, a widely recognized and legitimate business operation in Japan that effectively holds a monopoly over all assassinations across the country. Over 1,000 licensed assassins make up their ranks, and not a single assassin is permitted to kill unless they are working for or in the company. The Tokyo Bureau, the main headquarters of the JAA, is so large it has become an integral part of Tokyo City infrastructure. All assassination contracts, as well as additional services offered by the JAA, such as weapons manufacturing or assassination cleanup, are all handled through the Tokyo Bureau. And today, a day that started like any other would be the day it all came crumbling down. In the last video, Taro Sakamoto, with the help of his adopted family and other members of the order, were able to successfully end the threat of the four death row inmates let loose in Japan. However, after defeating and rescuing one of them, named Apart, he reveals the most sinister intent behind the release of the prisoners. To remove all high-profile assassins from JAA headquarters in order to leave it vulnerable for an invasion. Try as Sakamoto might to spring into action, unfortunately for the assassin world, the gears have already begun to turn. Arriving on a small innocent bike, even with a handbasket, two of the most dangerous men in the entire country arrive at the front door of JAA's Tokyo Bureau. Politefully looking for somewhere to leave their bicycle, god forbid they illegally park, Slur, better known as X, has personally decided to show his face for this special occasion. The criminal ringleader accompanied by another extremely powerful hitman named Gaku. Gaku, who has clearly never been to the JAA headquarters, comments on how large the building is, indicating to us that Gaku is an assassin who has clearly worked off the grid up until this point. Considering we just learned all legal assassination has to be permitted by the JAA and no competitor organizations exist. Slur, on the other hand, knows exactly where the bike rack at the front entrance is, appearing much more as someone returning to their old stomping ground. Encountering a security guard on the way in, both Gaku and Slur admit they aren't current JAA members. Slur claims he used to have a license, but he threw it out because it was a bad picture. The security guard doesn't play games and pulls his gun to blast these intruders on sight. But before this poor, definitely underpaid parking lot cop can pull the trigger, the newly introduced Gaku blows a complete fucking hole in the guard's torso with his bare hand simply just continuing his conversation with Slur as if the guard was just a fly buzzing around him. And as they continue their way in, Gaku is just dusting security guards left and right, sending them to the shadow realm. It's not like these guys are regular police officers either. Every single guard is a licensed holding trained assassin that these two no-names are just swanning away as they carry on shooting the shit. While it's kind of hard to imagine that Slur, who supposedly has an entire gang of cronies, would just show up with only one other man to take down an entire assassin organization after the short meeting Shin had with Slur and Okutabi Lab where just his killing intent alone was enough to paralyze Shin, it was made pretty clear Slur was not a threat to underestimate. And Gaku, the newcomer who tagged along, definitely doesn't appear like much of a rookie himself. All that being said, can two people really dismantle the entire headquarters of the JAA? Now that's a thought that's even harder to believe for all the employees working in the building, even after they hear intruders have fought their way past the first floor. One worker even claims the culprits must be idiots, and another says he's not even dignifying the sounding off alarm with a response. There is literally no possible or conceivable way that two people alone could massacre their way through legions of expertly trained assassins, all of them carrying countless firearms while also being heavily outnumbered and not knowing the full extent of what they're even up against? Ha! Imagine two morons like that making it all the way up to the third floor. Uh, do, do you think he heard me call him a moron?
After splitting up, Gaku has wasted no time clearing all the floors of employees. Even as more teams are put together and whole gun squads are firing on him, Gaku is just casually blitzing through storms of bullets, never wasting a single attack, decapitating, or just outright breaking apart the foes that get in his way. Even more veteran assassins with advanced weaponry break through a nearby wall and clock the intruder point blank with gauntlets. But Gaku comes back from this completely unharmed, revealing his polearm slash meat tenderizer has a small hand cannon at the end of it, bursting off around into the veteran's face to stun him before Gaku winds up his swing and bats the veteran's skull miles away for a home run. Just when he's beginning to feel on a roll though, a chill strikes the air and Gaku loses his nerve. A strong and dangerous aura suddenly drenches the entire headquarters. Fresh from his tapioca stop after Tokyo Tower, a taxi cab pulls up to JAA headquarters. Old man Takamura has just arrived, and the senior citizens start shredding Slur's henchmen like can openers from the moment he steps on the scene, cutting his way from the entrance all the way up to the third floor, revealing that heavy feeling of death that left Gaku shivering was coming from Takamura, the predator finally reaching its prey. As Takamura mutters sweet nothings to himself, he wanders aimlessly down the hall. And despite the look of a senile old man, Gaku's smart enough to see through that deception. The toughest battle of Gaku's whole goddamn life has just begun. On the other side of the bureau, Slur embarked on his own separate path through the headquarters. However, surprisingly, the man doesn't appear nearly as bloodthirsty as Gaku. Slur is just casually reading a book he's brought with him and avoids most conflicts by just, you know, taking the elevator. Slur does eventually run into a group of assassins once reaching the top floor, and as all four men pull out their weapons in response, shockingly, the man who fires first puts bullets into all three of his allies from behind instead of Slur. The traitor addresses Slur as boss and casually asks Slur if he's lost weight since they last saw each other, despite, you know, just murdering three of his co-workers all casual-like. This man's name is Uda, an assassin employed by the JAA who has actually been a mole for Slur his entire last year. In their catch-up conversation, Slur also makes mention of other agents, implying Uda is only one of the many double agents Slur has working behind the scenes. Slur politely apologizes to his friend for forcing him to work away and undercover for such a long time. However, Udo admits the JAA wasn't all too bad, and it came with good pay and benefits. Which, I I'm sorry, side tangent, do you apply to work at the JAA on like fucking Indeed or something? Is it like on a need to know basis, you have to know someone in the business and get recommended? What kind of resume skills help you qualify? What does an assassin interview even look like? I'm getting carried away, I'm sorry. But my point is, it just seems very too easy for this man to get into the JAA for an entire year with a background in who knows what from who knows where. And the sad thing is, when Slur asks Uda if he's made friends to pass the time, Uda admits they've all probably been stationed on the third floor, so they're already dead. Uda straight up just does not care at all though. He's much more focused on Slur's plan going into motion, dreaming of when this day would come for a long time. The day of Slur's revolution against the JAA, when he resets the entire assassin world to zero and creates a new world from the ashes. Mr. Reindeer was not lying about the gravity of Slur's ambitions. Small and petty crimes like Okutabi Lab, in comparison, were merely just the beginning. Back on the third floor, Gaku wastes no time in jumping Takamura, attempting to smash the weak bones of the elderly and putting all of his weight into one downward slam. Or so Gaku intended, as Takamura is just lazily holding back Gaku with the hilt of his blade. And in less than another second, Takamura's sword goes from showing a flicker of steel to severing the entire third floor in two. A slash that reverberates through every desk and concrete wall just from the force it was swung with alone. Gaku lost two fingers and an ear, even while dodging. But the gang member knew any further hesitation means death, instantly responding with a counterattack. But before his sword was even resheathed, Takamura, in one swift motion, dices Gaku's entire weapon to pieces, leaving Gaku to only smirk in disbelief 
at least before he realizes Takamura is making another slash. Cutting back to the other side of headquarters again, Uda and Slur can hear the building structure cripple from the battle between Gaku and Takamura. Surprised that he can feel old man Takamura's killing intent from this far away, Slur comments he's surprised that old geezer's even still alive and kicking. Acknowledging Takamura as the main problem, Slur admits he needs to hurry this invasion up, but almost as if the universe itself intended to stop him, Sakamoto, Shin, and a part Spider-Man swing into the crumbling Tokyo headquarters right on time to stand in Slur's way, conveniently crashing onto the exact floor that Slur was on, putting Sakamoto finally face to face with the man that started this whole story. After all this time, Sakamoto can confront this Slur, or X, whatever he is. But shockingly, Sakamoto doesn't refer to this villain by either of his codenames. In fact, Sakamoto calls Slur by what we can only assume is the gang leader's real government name, Uzuki. And it's here we think back to that time Shin encountered Slur at the Okutabi lab. Slur did ask to give Sakamoto his regards personally, and it's here all of that kind of connects. How Sakamoto's bounty has anything to do with this whole assassin revolution. Sakamoto admits out loud he's surprised Uzuki is still alive, while Uzuki just remarks he's sad to see an old friend get so out of shape. But with all the formalities out of the way, Sakamoto cuts right to the chase, demanding to know why Slur put the bounty on Sakamoto's head, despite the latter being in retirement for years. But without missing a beat, Slur blinks right in front of Sakamoto, stabbing him in the torso in the middle of his sentence, simply asking, when did the world's greatest hitman become so talkative? Things immediately escalate as Slur moves way too fast for Sakamoto to counter or even keep up with. Before Shin can move in to help, Uda puts Shin in submission and puts a gun to his temple. But thankfully, both Sakamoto and Shin brought apart, who, after finally finding people who have accepted him for who he is, allies himself with the Sakamoto family, saving Shin from Uda's grasp, ready to fight to the death to protect his new connections. Unfortunately, in that very same breath, Slur manages to slice off a part's arm before the death row prisoner even can comprehend what just happened. Uda moves just as quickly, seconds away from ending Shin's life if Sakamoto not recovered in time to kick Uda away. Sakamoto is lethally wounded, and blood is spraying out of the stab wound made by Slur. Honestly, even Uda and Slur are kind of surprised that wasn't enough to finish Sakamoto off. Sakamoto yells at Shin for both him and a part to stay out of this fight, despite Shin begging to help. This is clearly something personal Sakamoto does not want to involve them with. But also, based on how things have gone so far, it must be very clear how severely outmatched all three of them are to Sakamoto. This is the exact warning both Granny Mia and Nagumo have been trying to give Sakamoto since he started this journey. Even Uda, Slur's assistant, thinks he can handle all three of these protagonists himself. But Slur declines, claiming it would be a waste not to toy with his old pal Sakamoto. Slur ominously asks if Sakamoto wants to try and kill him again, and as if that was a trigger, Sakamoto springs into action, only to once again be humbled by Slur, who slips behind Sakamoto mid-attack, calls him naive, and delivers another critical strike across Sakamoto's entire body. Slur insults the Sakamoto family's no-killing rule. The way that Slur sees it, the more Sakamoto restricts himself from killing, the more the people around him are gonna get hurt. People who hold themselves back only bring misfortune about for others, a trait that reminds Slur of his old self. A comment that Sakamoto is clearly able to recognize, but of course, we aren't able to decipher this at this moment. Slur decides to give Sakamoto an example of what he means, and goes right for Shin's throat a third time, once again forcing Sakamoto to rescue him and take the attack in Shin's place, who, at this point, Sakamoto's losing a lot of blood and is barely standing. Not only is Sakamoto restricting his full killing potential, something that the JCC, an assassin school both Sakamoto and Slur apparently attended, taught them to always release at its fullest, 
Sakamoto is also carrying around loads of dead weight, namely Shin and his other adopted family. Slur claims the best way for Shin to actually help Sakamoto would be to take his own life. Since then, Sakamoto would no longer have to worry about him. All these responsibilities and other dumb things like morals is making Sakamoto's life a lot harder than it needs to be. And Slur simplifies it. Sakamoto has a heart now, and you don't need a heart to kill. If Sakamoto refuses to kill Slur, it could result in someone else dying. Someone very close to Sakamoto. And funnily enough, a little birdie just whispered into Slur's ear recently that Sakamoto has a young daughter back at home, doesn't he? One sentence. That's all it took for Sakamoto to snap. His intention to kill fluctuating as strong as it did five years ago when he was at his peak. Perhaps even more. Slur smiles, knowing he's finally managed to get underneath Sakamoto's skin. He welcomes back the world's greatest hitman, Japan's most lethal assassin, Taro Sakamoto. But as he moves in, having every intention to rip Slur from this life, a flash of Sakamoto's family hits his eyes. In the last moment, Shin calls to Sakamoto, almost making him hesitate. But before we know if that killing blow would ever connect, Gaku busts through the wall between Slur and Sakamoto. Not too far behind is Takamura, cutting through the door and tipping its handle open, carrying the presence of death itself. The Grim Reaper makes his appearance known, putting everyone in the room on high alert. Gaku even suggests aborting the mission to Slur, because fighting a smoke demon like Takamura Mora is not what he signed up for, which is crazy to think this one elderly man was more of a deterrent to Gaku than toppling the entire Hitman organization of Japan. This leaves Uda no choice but to take it upon himself and attempt to take Takamura out. Firing off a couple bullets that Takamura just casually cleaves right through, Uda then tries to abuse his speed advantage and get behind Takamura, but the old man just flips his grip and stabs the blade backwards cleaving through Uda's finger, gun, and eventually his throat. And although this is enough to motivate Gaku back into battle, it leads to instant regret on his part because Takamura again slips one last attack in before the blades resheath. this time instead of his weapon, taking Gaku's left arm. Granted, gotta give Gaku props, he's built differently enough to shake this limb loss off like it's nothing and kick his disembodied arm back at the elderly threat as if it's its weapon, but Takamura is strong enough to block Locked that second blue lock strike kick of the arc, getting off with only a few cracks in his sword. This gives Gaku a look in his eyes as if he has an idea. But before Takamura can swing down his death blade once more, Slurp pulls Gaku out of the battle by the collar, barely saving Gaku from another entire floor encompassing cleave. Even Sakamoto and Shin are narrowly able to avoid it, realizing they're both severely outclassed in the fight that's going on right now. Gaku tries to goad Slur into taking Takamura on, but he comically shrugs it off, as if admitting not even he could deal with someone of Takamura's caliber. Which, if not even Slur is willing to fight Takamura, that old man really might be the current title holder for the world's strongest. As Slur attempts to make his escape, Sakamoto tries to stand in his way one final time. Yet no matter how strong Sakamoto's will is, he's nowhere close to a level that can effectively clash with Slur, or as we know now, Uzuki. Takamura also jumps in to try and ambush the gang, but unfortunately for everyone, Uda was still hanging on to life by a thread, revealing to be rigged with a self-destructive bomb. Slur apologizes once more to Uda, for now, making him give up his entire life for Slur's dreams. But Uda assures Slur that it's no worries at all. The traitor was most likely bleeding out from Takamura's stab anyway. Uda grabs on to the old geezer from behind and yanks his bomb cord with every last ounce of strength, cloaking the entire floor in a massive explosion. Amongst the chaos, Sakamoto was only able to shield the nearby Shin with his apron, meaning, sadly, the unconscious apart was lost in the blast. But before the two of them can rest, 
Slur's knife drops to the floor between them. His presence lays hidden behind the clearing smoke, whispering something to Sakamoto that we're unable to make out, but whatever was said leaves Sakamoto speechless. By the time the floor is emptied out of smoke, everyone has already disappeared. The only survivors remaining amongst the rubble being Sakamoto and Shin alone. After the invasion of the Tokyo Bureau had reached its end, over 176 assassins had lost their lives. Only a half a year after Slur began his purge of assassins, the total of registered hitmen across the country has dropped 75%. Days pass, and Sakamoto is bedridden at the hospital, recovering from his injuries. Meanwhile, a very shameful Shin hides behind the wall to Taro's room. When everything came to a head at JAA headquarters, Shin was nothing more than dead weight. It would have been fine to handle Slur's insults of inadequacy, but what hurt the most was Sakamoto's pleas for Shin to escape the tower. Even though Shin may have proved himself by standing up to Saw, what good is that strength if Shin isn't even strong enough to face Sakamoto now? Before Shin can muster the courage to deliver his get well basket though, Kyo and Nagumo from the Order barge directly into Sakamoto's hospital room. Nagumo, in his own special way, is here to check on his old pal Sakamoto and make sure Hyo doesn't fly off the handle. But much to Nagumo's dismay, Hyo flies off the handle. Pyo demands to know what Sakamoto learned from his meeting with Slur, and Sakamoto confirms the fact that seems to even wipe the smirk off Nagumo's face. The assassin killer Slur, also known as X's true identity, is that of K. Uzuki, a former associate of both Sakamoto's and apparently Nagumo's as well. This immediately invests Nagumo in the conversation, who asks flat out if Sakamoto failed to kill Uzuki, quote unquote, that time again alluding to whatever history surrounds Uzuki and Sakamoto that has been lying dormant in the background. We're not sure why or when Sakamoto was supposed to kill Uzuki, but the consequences of failing to accomplish this mission have led us straight down this path. But the real question really is, if Sakamoto was supposed to kill Uzuki, why didn't he? Nagumo explains that Uzuki is a former classmate of theirs from Assassin Training School. And Hyo claims, whoever Uzuki is, he didn't leave enough of an impression at the school for Hyo to hear about him during his tenure. Considering all the rumors about Sakamoto, Nagumo, and a third student named Akao, Hyo thinks he should have at least known something. Either way, having gotten what they came for, Hyo and Nagumo make their leave. Sakamoto, however, tries to stand in their way. He bluffs, claiming Sakamoto's actually got way more information to give, but he's only gonna reveal it if the Order works together with him on this case. This would then mark the second time Hyo flew off the handle, as Hyo responds by slamming his foot down onto Sakamoto's hospital bed, splitting it almost in two. He sets the record straight and reminds Sakamoto that the Order is not his ally. Sakamoto's in no position to bargain with the JAA. Sakamoto's family is also involved in the situation now, and if he dies, who's gonna take care of Aoi and Hana? Sure, Taro can reply that he has no intentions of dying in this fight, but Hyo responds with a crippling punch between Sakamoto's eyes, tearing the already wounded man through an entire wall of the hospital. And if Hyo was actually intending to kill Sakamoto with that attack, he would have been able to do nothing to stop it. And that's exactly Hyo's point, once again finally echoing out the same sentiment resonating throughout this whole arc. Sakamoto, as he is now, is not strong enough to fight Uzuki. Despite this, Sakamoto claims this is a duty a father simply can't shy away from. No one should be more justified to protect his own flesh and blood than Sakamoto himself. Pyo takes this as Sakamoto being selfish, not putting his faith in others. But Sakamoto corrects Hyo, saying that sentiment used to be true, but it's not anymore. And right on cue, Shin finally built up the courage to join the fray, coming from behind Hyo and helping Sakamoto throw the order member into a nearby MRI machine, magnetizing all the metal on his body and keeping him in place. Hope that never comes back into play. Instead of continuing the fight, Sakamoto shows his vulnerability and pleads with the Order member. Sakamoto needs all the information he can get to keep his family safe. An honest-to-God genuine favor that the heart of gold hidden in Hyo's iron chest can't bear to ignore. 
In order to not directly reveal the Order's hand, Kyo tipped Sakamoto off that while he can't give assassin info out to pedestrians, if Sakamoto was to re-enroll in the JCC Assassin School and access its database, they could technically hack Keiuzuki's files. Which was more than enough of a tip to send Sakamoto off on his next destination. Meanwhile, they leave Hyo stuck in the MRI machine without actually getting any information in return. Something Nagumo surely is not gonna let Hyo live down for years. As Sakamoto and Shin overlook the city, Shin admits his feelings of insecurity being a burden during the JAA invasion. Sakamoto, however, responds by enlightening Shin to another perspective. When Slur brought up Sakamoto's daughter, he almost lost himself completely. Sakamoto was inches away from breaking his own family rules, but Shin was there to keep Sakamoto grounded. And Sakamoto admits that even if Shin doesn't think so, he's always saving Sakamoto. And Sakamoto needs Shin's help now more than ever. In the aftermath of the invasion, Osaragi and Shishiba wander through the rubble and mourn the loss of their main office. JAA stock is plummeting, assassination jobs are getting canceled left and right, and worst of all, they might not even be getting Christmas bonuses this year. They've waited long enough. It's time to summon all the remaining Order members together. Meanwhile, speaking of new faces, Slur rejoins Kashima and Gaku as the former is restitching Gaku's arm together. Thankfully, the cut Takamura gave to Gaku was so clean, all the muscle tissue was surprisingly still alive. Slur admits the only real reason they even failed is because he miscalculated thinking Takamura was no longer a threat. As long as he, the physical incarnation of the assassin world's bloodlust exists. Their dream will never see fruition. They cannot keep running wild with the small group they have left. This time, they lost Uda. Next time, the losses could be much worse. And with Sakamoto and friends now also becoming obstacles, Slur claims they're gonna have to increase the size of their roster to make the two sides even. But instead of recruiting from inside the JAA, this time, Slur's got the idea to seek out fresh blood. You know, it's much easier to paint over a blank canvas than re-educate some mediocre assassin. In fact, the gears of Slur's plan for recruitment might already be in motion. We return to the Sakamoto family convenience store, where Shin reveals he's never actually attended the JCC. He got his assassin license from an outside exam. Therefore, the only one who really knows anything about the prestigious assassin school is Sakamoto. And after the crew looks it up, it turns out the JCC is actually a pretty damn official schooling path for the people of this world. It has an entire public website that describes its facilities, class size, and graduation rate in full detail, even sharing fun facts like 90% of attendees either drop out or die in their first four years. Lewis surprised both Sakamoto and especially Heisuke were able to graduate from such a dangerous place. But Sakamoto admits even as an alumni, the JCC is almost impossible to infiltrate. There's only one way in and one way out. But before Sakamoto can reveal that secret, his wife spills the beans. She found JCC entrance applications in their living room and accuses Sakamoto of attempting to send their daughter to killer school. And as Sakamoto cringes, the irony of the situation takes a while to settle in before Shin realizes, oh, it isn't Hana that Sakamoto is thinking of enrolling in the JCC? Over the loudspeakers, a pilot announces for passengers to fasten their seatbelts, among other formalities. And in no time at all, before Shin even knew what hit him, he realized the applications were for them to take a one-way plane ride to JCC Assassin University. On their way to the entrance exam to become brand new students, Sakamoto's chowing down some airline food, while Shin has an absolute panic attack leading us off on the perfect segue to the next destination of our story, the beginning of the JCC transfer exams. Thank you all so much for watching this far into the video, and make sure to hit that like button and subscribe if you want to see the next part as soon as possible. See you guys later, everyone. Peace.